Today's episode is brought to you by MRC, a branding studio hailing out of Raleigh, North Carolina, where they focus on crafting killer design work for clients that love uber creative solutions for companies small and large. You can find and connect with them online at mrcraleigh.com. That's M-R-C-R-A-L-E-I-G-H and at MRC Raleigh on Instagram. The good news is if you find yourself reaching out, you'll most likely get to chat with yours truly. That's right. It's my little branding co and we're here to make your brand or idea look amazing. So let's connect. Today's episode is also sponsored by Bernie Wilds Adventure Sauce. Bernie Wilds is an adventure brand that's a place where my love of art and food come together in all the right ways. Bernie Wilds Adventure Sauce is a chef-driven heat sauce that in my book is literally the tastiest and most versatile condiment on the planet. This is an everyday sauce that's perfect with salads, fries, burgers, sushi, and pasta. I call it comfort food in a bottle, and it's 100% all-natural, plant-based, gluten-free, and flavor-packed. Its unique, craveable flavor has a chipotle smokiness that's perfectly balanced with its creamy carrot base, mixed with a bit of maple syrup, charred onion, miso, and ahi amarillo. But don't take my word for it. If you want to see what others have to say, visit BernieWilds.com to check out more. And speaking of, we also sell Bernie Wilds comic books and comic panels created and signed by me, not to mention super dope stickers, shirts, and more. I'm giving each and every one of our Pencil Pushers listeners 20% off for their first online order to show my love for all you supporters of the podcast. So just go to BernieWilds.com, place your order, and enter the code PENCIL. That's B-U-R-N-Y-W-I-L-D-S dot com. That's it, folks. It's that easy. And now, without further ado, on to the show. Because if we find out what our weaknesses are, that's really the answer key to growing. Recorded at the Kitchen Studios, this is the Pencil Pushers Podcast. Welcome, Leadheads, to another fine episode of the Pencil Pushers Podcast. I'm, as always, your humble host, Mike Rosado. Today, I'm excited to share with you another fantastic guest of the conversation, former animator and current animation director and producer, Saul Blinkoff. Saul has not only had a highly successful career in animation, but has spent many years touring the world talking about how to live your best life, or like the name of his own podcast, Live a Life of Awesome. Our talk ran the gamut of how to be a great leader in the creative arts to the incredible stories of working at Disney during the Renaissance years in the 90s, all peppered with some of the best words of wisdom any person at any age could take with them. I had an absolute blast getting to know Saul, and I know you will too. So do yourself a favor, sit back, relax, grab yourself a nice cold one, and enjoy my talk with Saul. We are here with Saul Blinkoff. I'm super excited to have you here, buddy. It's a real pleasure to have you. Just to give the listeners a little bit of a interest into Saul's career, he's a veteran in animation industry. He started out at Walt Disney Studios. He's a former animator. He's currently a director. He's also produced a lot of film and TV. You've seen some of his stuff in movies like Pocahontas, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan and Tarzan, but he also has done a lot of stuff for TV and streaming shows like Doc McStuffins, Llama Llama, Madagascar a little wild and um, he's pretty much run the gamut. I'm really excited to talk to you not only just because of your career in animation but also I was really inspired when I got to learn a little bit about you. First of all, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mike. It's so good to be here. And you know, when you said the names of some of those projects, each one of those, while I'm very proud of them, they remind me of just one thing in common, an insane amount of hard work. Mm. (laughs) Like it's so simple to rattle off the name of something, but to put the work in for these projects year after year with an incredible team that I've been lucky enough to work with different teams, it's just an insane amount of hard work. I'm just overwhelmed by the work that that I and my team have put into those projects. But thank you so much for having me and excited to meet your audience. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's kind of like start off a little bit there. One thing that I don't think a lot of people do understand is how much work goes into producing even, you know, 25, 30 minute TV shows. And we'll we'll start right here. I mean, as a director, it's definitely something where you're getting, um, you've got to rally the troops. You've got to... You've got to come up with a creative that's going to be something that's going to be entertaining. You've got to pe- keep people inspired, motivated, 
as a director right now, what is, what's the most challenging thing that you get out of uh, your job every day? Yeah, great question. I mean, first of all, when you say challenging, I'll translate that as the most difficult, right? And I'll say the reason what I'm about to share is the most difficult because the stakes of not doing it well are extreme, right? If something is, is difficult, the stakes are, are life and death. You know, if someone's doing surgery, open heart surgery, that's a challenging surgery because if there's a mistake made, the person's going to die. Taking a splinter out of your foot it's probably not going to kill anybody. So in my line of work, for me, the greatest challenge and the thing that is the most difficult because the stakes are so dramatic, it's two things. Number one is making sure that the stories that I'm a part of telling are actually teaching, nurturing, or impacting the world, uh, the viewer. I take very seriously the projects that I work on. Um, you know, I'm, I want to make sure the values and the content that I that I am part of creating are making an impact. I mean, I've turned down jobs before. I've had jobs mm. offered to me from certain studios that's kids animation, and I would watch, you know, an animatic. Someone wanted me to direct, and I'm like, no, I can't, I can't do that. You know, it was too yeah. crass, even for kids stuff. So the first thing is just making sure that the projects that I work on are in line with my values. That's number mm. one. Mm -hmm. Number two. Uh, and the most challenging thing is making sure in a leadership position that I do my part to help create a culture that is going to uh, empower the artists that work on these projects and also let them know that the culture is one of respect and appreciation. You know, I just finished a job at DreamWorks. I've been supervising producing a Madagascar preschool show for over four years. And every single artist that I hire, I say the same thing to them when I'm interviewing them. Is it cool to be at DreamWorks? Yeah. Is it cool to be working on Madagascar? Yeah. But put that aside. The only thing that matters to me more than anything is that you, as an artist, as a production person, whatever the job is, that you feel appreciated and respected. And managing uh, the personalities you know, I've worked for many people throughout my life. You know, I've been working, I started Disney in the 90s, working on Pocahontas and Hunchback. And I've had some bosses throughout my days that are terrible. And I've had some bosses that are encouraging and empowering and appreciative. So I always said, if I ever got to that place of leadership, that I would take the responsibility of that leadership seriously and do my part to create a culture and to help create a culture that people feel respected and appreciated and you know look artists have egos and it's not so simple and how do you keep your ego at the door and and what happens when i have a storyboard artist or a director working on my show that's maybe not hitting it out of the park or it's having like personality challenges with someone else how do i deal with that you know i learned how to draw my whole life i didn't learn how to i didn't learn how to be a therapist my whole life but part of being a leader is learning how to manage people and bring the best out of them. And I'll tell you something, Mike, it's very important for me personally that anyone that works on any production I'm producing or directing, that people don't go through the production, but that they grow through the production. So that's basically the biggest challenge for me. So um, walk me through what it is like um, with that, that idea in mind every day. Like for example, how do you deal with that storyboard artist who's having a bad week or a bad month or doesn't feel particularly inspired or is frustrated for whatever reason? Yeah. Amazing question. Amazing question. As my dog's barking in the background. He <laughs> Don't the worry about too. it. It's all good. Here, here's the thing. The only way to have a relationship with an artist, if I'm in a leadership position, where it's going to be real, where it's going to be real. And what does that mean? They're going to be vulnerable. They're going to communicate to you, let you know what they're going through, let you know what their challenges and struggles are so that you can help them. The only way is you need to have two things. Number one is you have to have trust with that person. They have to trust that you want the best for them and that they don't, they're not doing their jobs in fear. And for anyone in a leadership position, listen very carefully because I can't stress this enough. And I always equate this to like um, a trapeze artist. A trapeze artist, you know, they're up there on the trapeze and they're flipping around and all that. And if they fall, 
there's a net there. But what if that net wasn't there? They probably wouldn't be able to do their job so well. They'd be so nervous about dying. And I have worked on projects where people are nervous for their jobs. They're constantly nervous for their jobs. So I like to assure artists and production people that I work with, don't worry, you can take a risk because there will always be that net there. And I encourage people that I work with to take risks. And, and, I, and I, just as a father, it's the same thing. I have four kids. You know, I want my kids to know it's okay to fail. That's the only way we learn. That's the only way we grow. And we have to Agreed. make sure that we, right, that we create a production culture where people feel like they can take a risk. What does that mean? In a big meeting with 20 people, you can say an idea that's not a good idea. Because from that not good idea, we just got clarity, what didn't work, and it might help us figure out what better works. So there's no waste of time. Every time, you know, it's like, like creativity, the creative process, and even a lot of artists listening, you know, like you have to just put that clay down there and start sculpting it and figure out what it can be. But as a leader, I try to create that culture where people can take a risk and, and have that relationship with them where they know that they can trust me. I'm on their side. I support them. That's yeah. number one. You're that number, net. That exactly. That's exactly it. And number two is... It's so important for people to feel and for me genuinely to empathize with their day-to-day -day challenges as an artist. You know, I want to know what they're going through. You know, if, if, they're, if I see artists that are working overtime and I walk by their desks and I'll, and I'll just talk to them, like, how's it going? Like, tell me what's, what's working for you, what's not. Like, they want to know that you care. And it's a quote I once heard, more than people will ever care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. So in a, leader, in a leadership position, it's so important to make sure that our, our staff, our team, artists, production, everyone, that they know that we empathize with them. By the way, same thing as a father. You know, I want my kids to know, like, whatever. They're going through a tough day. My nine-year-old daughter, Naomi, she has a tough day. I want to hear about it. If she's going to open up to me, then she needs to know that, you know what, my dad is going to listen to me. He's going to empathize with me. And so important He's not going to judge me. If they feel judged, then they're only going to want to share with you something when they know they're going to get the effect like, oh, I know he's going to be proud of me. He's going to be excited by what I did. Only the successes. I don't want that. I want a real relationship. And that means they have to know that, that I, they can trust me. I'm supporting them. I'm that net, like you said. And then also that I feel for what they're going through. Yeah. If you have that, then that, that's leadership. Yeah. In my opinion, that's leadership. You yeah, know? it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, the owner and creative director of uh, my branding company and I have a small team that, that uh, uh, has created pretty much a really strong bond. We have a really great bond and great. and they're super talented. They could work anywhere. Right. They could work with some of the right. best in the business. Right. And, um, <clears throat> you know, for me in a leadership position, what I have focused on a lot is. Empathy, vulnerability uh, is like being really key components. I mean, especially as you were saying, you know, when you're dealing yeah. with artists, you've got you've got egos involved, right. you've got sensitivity. A lot of times, artists in general are very passionate about what they what they do, but they also can crumble really easily, and that can backfire right. in a lot of ways if you don't handle it right. Sure. But the but the thing, and sure. I think that I it um, I don't think I'm wrong here. But I think that you and I are very similar because I've watched several of your videos and I've heard you tell your story a few times and I think we're very similar in the sense that we're both very introspective and we want to be better people every day. And, right. and I think that that is like one of the, the uh, most important qualities for dealing with people is because there's, there's no way that you're going to be able to be a better person if you're not like being uh, what I would say is like having humility, like having the ability to like sit back and reflect on how you approached uh, speaking to somebody in particular or how you handled a difficult situation. You right. have the ability to sit back in your own thoughts. And what I did was, uh, and, and tell me if this is the same for you, because I, I think it might be. When I was uh, an employee, before I became a leader, I had this leadership position, I would spend uh, a lot of time saying, well, I could do this better. You know, I could, I, I could, I could, I could be in this leadership position. Once right. I got in that position, now I needed to actually 
act on what I said I wanted out of my leader, you know, my own leaders. And I feel like the empathetic nature of myself and wanting to be introspective helped me be a better leader because I started to think about like, what would I want if I was, if the roles were reversed? Now I'm a leader. What -hmm. would I want in the leader, you know, today, right? Do you feel that same sort of thing for yourself? Yeah, that's, that's a great way to approach it is, 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 is how would I want someone to speak to me? How, what would I feel? Um, you know, I've had, man, I could tell you so many stories <laughs> right? I bet. of, uh, of, of just terrible. I mean, of, of times, you know, I was working on Mulan or working on a movie, uh, Disney, and I had a boss that was tough on me or the, a boss that was trying to make my life hell. I mean, I've had it all. Mm-hmm. I've had all those experiences. I can go on and on, but yeah, it's because of those experiences. Like I wished that I had a boss at a certain time in my career that said, good job. You know, thanks for the effort. I appreciate the, the blood, sweat and tears you're putting into this. Um, you know, was you, that, a, was that a rarity? Yeah, it was a rarity, but you know, when you have them, oh, it was a rarity to hear that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, it's, you, you touched on a word, which I think is the key word and that's humility. And truthfully, the only way in my humble opinion to have unity is to have humility. Mm. You can't, you cannot have unity without humility. Humility is the prerequisite. Because it means it's, and and it sounds like cliches, but this has to be real. It's not about me. I'll give you one example. Early on in my career, I was promoting the film Pocahontas. I was 22 years old, and I was traveling the country, 26 cities in six months, on a mall tour called the Pocahontas Animation Discovery Adventure. Wow. I just started at Disney. 22. Working at Pocahontas. Yeah, and I was just like dreamer couldn't believe I achieved my dream and one of the first things the company asked me to do right when I got hired and started working on the movie they sent me out on the road (laughs) 26 cities in six months to malls all around the country speaking to thousands of people a day about the making of the film Pocahontas and it was really cool Walt Disney Imagineering built a giant boat that looked like the Susan Constant the boat from the movie yeah and there was you know a lot of press Good Morning America every city you went to there was tons of press and interviews and I was in commercials and it was a lot you know and I remember I get to one place um, I think it was Baltimore Maryland and I get off the stage and there's, you know, a couple of hundred people there and I sign autographs for kids and I sign Disney stuff. And this old guy, really old guy, must have been in his 70s, comes up to me and he's waiting in line the whole time. And he says to me, I just want to thank you for, for Fantasia. I love that movie. Oh, my gosh. And I remember thinking in my head, does he realize I wasn't alive in the 40s to make that movie? You know what I mean? Right? So I just, I just said, well, thank you for saying that, you know? And I walked away and I thought he was crazy because I'm like, doesn't he realize yeah. I'm only 22? You know? Right, right. My parents weren't even alive then, you know? And then I realized something really profound. I realized he wasn't thanking me. Mm. It's that I represented the Walt Disney Company. That's the first time he ever met a human being who represented the company that created a movie that meant Meant so so much to him. him. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And that's when I realized it's so much bigger than me. I remember working on Mulan. I was working at the Disney MGM Studios. Today it's called the Disney Hollywood Studios. Mm -hmm. And we used to have an animation tour there where people could walk by. I'm sure you remember it, Mike. Oh, yeah. We we called it the fishbowl. And I had my desk right by the glass there, and I was working on Pocahontas, and people would walk through the tour all day, thousands of people watching me work and watching the other artists. It was really cool. But working on Mulan, I worked on Mulan for about four years in that building. And I would tell people, my family, they're like, what movie you work? And I'm like, Mulan. They're like, what? Like, no one ever heard of it. It wasn't, not, and I'm like, don't worry, someday it's going to be big. You're going to know it. It's going to be big. <laughs> like, well, don't worry, it's big. But I remember walking through the park, and seeing kids wear Beauty and the Beast shirts and Aladdin and Lion King, right? This is like the Renaissance time, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I remember thinking like, wow, someday these kids are going to be wearing Mulan shirts. They're going right. to be wearing Tarzan shirts on the next movie I worked on. And it always grounded me. Even though I had a tough day working with some of my bosses at some days and some challenges that went through personalities and stuff, whenever I would walk out into the parks and I saw those kids 
it reminded me, you know what? Yeah, you can sit there and do, you know, sometimes sometimes I would do work in cleanup animation where you're doing what's called a trace back. Where you're basically drawing the same picture of Shang like all day in the exact same spot. So it looks like the lines are flickering. So it looks right. like it's, we call it, so it looks like it's breathing. Uh, and it's really the most mindless thing Those for thing like holds type thing? Those yeah, like exactly, holds, right, right. 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 If you were to hold, sometimes you would hold the body and yeah. you would just turn the face on sure. another level. Yeah. But sometimes you would draw and you'd want that whole hold to just flicker a little bit. So sure. you try to do your best cleaning up the line. And when it overlapped, it would just breathe the line a little. And I'm yeah. telling you, days like that, you shut off your brain, you put on movie soundtracks, or you get on the phone with somebody and you just shut off your brain and go. And sometimes my hand would hurt, it'd be tough. But how did I get through the minutia of days like that? Because I'd walk through the parks and I'd be like, this, is, this drawing is going to be part of a legacy that I hope to leave, where I get to be part of something much bigger than me. And by the way, I took a Xerox of every single drawing I've ever done for every Disney movie I've worked on, and we're talking stacks and stacks. And now it's such a thrill for me to share that with my children mm. and teach them some of the discipline that I put into the, the films I was working on and, and some of those experiences. But yeah, that's uh, you really have to have humility and realize that when you're part of a team, it's about the much bigger picture. It's not about us. I always say, be passionate about your work, but don't take it personally. And I also say a lot, and, and I really try to live this, that you have to leave your ego at the door. Yeah. You, you, you have to. You just have to. And I'm telling you personally, for me, there is nothing as thrilling as seeing an artist I work with feel that feeling of accomplishment. You know, on the, on the project I just wrapped, Madagascar, I had this guy come in. You got to hear this story. This is this is crazy. Yeah, let's okay? hear it. So I'm interviewing all these artists, trying to find a revisionist, a storyboard revisionist, right? Storyboard artists, of course, they draw like the comic strip kind of style frames that we make a movie before you animate the film. You mm -hmm. got to draw it out like a storyboard. Mm -hmm. Well, before you can get to be a storyboard artist, one of the first entry level art jobs is you're called a revisionist. You take the boards that someone else did that might be rough and you tie them down a little bit or... If there's notes that come in, and like the board artist has notes where they have to take the character, instead of having him run up the tree, he has to run around the tree first, the board artist can give it to a revisionist to help him or her kind of draw those in and fill those frames in, so to speak, and bring it okay. back. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm hiring a revisionist, and this one guy, I'm, I'm getting people from Pixar and Disney, I mean, top-level talent. This one guy comes in, and I look at his resume. He's never worked in animation before. And part of me is like, in my head, I'm like, who does he think he is? Like, I'm looking at people who've done this at Pixar. Why would I hire this guy? So what's his current job? His current job is he works at a Lasix eye surgery clinic at the front desk. And I'm like, and in my head, I'm like, is he serious? Does he really think I'm going to hire him on this? I open up his portfolio, and his work is much better than expected. Wow. It's not, it's not on the level of the Pixar and Disney people, but sure. it's still better than expected. But what I loved about this guy's portfolio is it was filled with hundreds of drawings. Mm. Not like 50, but hundreds. And he was so hungry mm. for this job and so eager <clears throat> and so disciplined in his portfolio that I hired him. And let, wow. me tell you, let me tell you what makes this a wow, my friend, is when I told HR, this is the guy I want to hire, and then they make the call. I, I, I told my wife and kids, I'm like, can you imagine what it must be like for him? By the way, I didn't tell you this. He was he was gonna be a, he was gonna be a lawyer, drops out of law school, starts learning animation at night on weekends, working at home, online classes, whatever he can for like three years. Can you imagine what it must have been like for him to tell his family, I'm dropping out of law school to be an artist? They must have been like, Are you crazy? And then can you imagine what it must have been like for his family to get a call from him after HR called him and told him he got the job at DreamWorks? Imagine what it must have been like when he calls his family and says, guess what, mom and dad, I just got hired as an artist. Amazing. I, I did it. Like, that's incredible to me. And guess what? Day one, nobody was hungrier than this guy. Yeah. He used to come in my office all the time. Saul, what else can I do? Right. What else can I learn? And right. I started giving him assignments. I'd be like, you know what? Go 
turn on your favorite movie and start storyboarding scenes from your favorite movie. You know, I love the movie The Rock. You know, Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage, like action movies from the 90s, yeah, right? Yeah. And there's just a great Ferrari uh, chase with that yellow Ferrari and a Hummer in that movie. And I tell a lot of students, like, just board out that chase. Look at the cuts. Look at the shots. Nice. Look at the camera moves and just learn. And I would give them assignments. Go thumbnail out this. I said, go thumbnail out sequences that you like. Find a comedic sequence in a movie that you like and go board it out. And now figure out why it's funny. Now go find an emotional sequence and then go find an action sequence. He did so much work above and beyond that by the end of our production, he became one of our full-fledged storyboard artists. And today, he is one of the top board artists at Disney. Uh, boarding really right and and part of my job as a producer director leader in any way is to not just look at who a person is but to help nurture who they can become and not just in other people but in ourselves like you said I, I want to be humble because I want to grow also you know if I get through a production and I'm the same ability wise as I was at the beginning then I just missed an opportunity to grow there's nothing more exciting than growing as an artist. I remember telling my yeah. parents, first Agreed. day of art school, I said to my mom, Mom, four years is not going to be enough. And she's like, why? And I said, because there's just so much I want to learn. Yeah. You know? Now, do you, do you uh, <laughs> spend much time drawing these days, by the way? Just out I of curiosity? Draw, I draw a lot uh, just to communicate to yeah. my directors and my artists on shots and camera moves and you know, because as, as a producer, I wear a lot of hats. I wear an art director hat, an animator hat, an, an artist, right, and camera and all that. So I draw just to communicate ideas. But the, the drawing for pleasure, you know, my favorite thing when I went to art school was figure drawing because that's what Disney looked for in their portfolios. My mm -hmm, portfolio mm -hmm. back then was, and many of those people from that generation in the olden days, as my kids call it, <laughs> was, was figure drawing and anatomy, all life drawing. Uh, and I loved that feeling of drawing the figure. I loved it. I used to draw caf at cafes, and and uh, I don't do that anymore. Sometimes, like if I'm if I'm ever at a place and I have a moment, or you know, if I have the the ability, of the, if I'm bored or something, I, I find the time to do it, and I and I just love it. But no, I don't. I don't get to do it like I used to, man. No. Yeah. And I used to love illustration too. My degree is in illustration. Okay. Yeah. And, and I used to love spending twenty hours on a painting, you know, and just really like fine tuning photorealism. But I, I don't do it anymore. My kids look at it now. They're like, Dad, you were an artist. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, back in the day, I used to paint. I used to do that. You know, but now I, uh, I don't. I don't do it anymore. Really. What do you What are you currently working on? What's the What's the show you're working on right now? Well, like I said, I just wrapped uh, Madagascar a little okay. wild. Yeah. It's a show at DreamWorks, a preschool show. We won uh, Best Series last year for Kid Screen. We're up for another big award this year. Nice. Everyone. Congrats. Thank you. Um, I'm very, very proud of the show. Great team, great music, great art. The animation is phenomenal and just there's great messages uh, in this in this work. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm always juggling a lot of things. I also... Um, I travel the world as an inspirational speaker. So I travel and speak to communities and schools and organizations. I'm doing a talk for a major company next week, uh, next month, Nestle Company, um, about motivation and, and, and growth and, and working on oneself and offering tools. Um, and then I also have a lot of my time is spent on my podcast. I have a podcast mm -hmm. called Life of Awesome. And uh, I call it that because I, I don't think life should just be good, and I definitely don't think it should be great. It should be awesome. Every day should be awesome. You know, if you're listening to this right now and you're married, then your marriage should be awesome. If you're a parent, if you're a father or a mom, you're, being a parent is an awesome responsibility. You should enjoy it every day. It doesn't mean it's not going to be work-free. Of course it takes work. You know, my son says to me a lot, he's like, Dad, I want to go try this or that. Do you think it's going to be easy? And I always say the same thing to him. If you want to be great at it, it will not be easy. To be great at anything takes an insane amount of struggle, pain, and hard work and discipline. And that goes for everything. That goes for life. You know, I want to be a better father. I want to be a better whatever. Mm -hmm. I got to put the work in. I got, to, I got to try to grow as a human being. So the podcast is a very exciting thing for me. You know, I get to interview some great people. I interviewed Rudy Rudiger, the movie Rudy, the football player, the most oh, inspirational yeah, yeah, sports yeah, yeah. movie. Yeah, he was my first guest. Wow. And as a matter of fact, it was his movie, Rudy, that inspired me 
to want to continue trying to get into Disney when I got rejected twice, by the way. Really? I got rejected twice. And I had given up on my dream. Yeah. I bet and he loved I saw hearing that, movie. that. Oh, yeah. It was just great to be able to connect with him and, and just tell him the gratitude that I had for his story and what it meant to me. Yeah. Um, I also interview um, you know, a lot of animation people. I interviewed Alan Menken, of course, the Oscar-winning oh, songwriter. Wow. From Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and Hercules and I mean Hunchback, a lot, tons of stuff. He's amazing. Um, did I interviewed you interview uh, Solanga just, last month? Just out of curiosity, did you um, get a chance to work with him and Howard uh, in your Renaissance day during the Renaissance days in the nineties? Yeah, yeah, they were. The, I mean, Howard. No, he Howard died before I got there. But Alan Menken, okay. um, yeah, Hunchback was really the only film that we worked on together. Um, but I got to know him through the years. I remember, I think I met him in person the first time when he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Uh, I'm dear friends with one of the greatest songwriters who ever lived. His name is Desmond Child. He wrote Living La Vida Loca. He wrote Living oh, on wow. a Prayer, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith. Dude looked like a lady, like an incredible guy. He oh, and I my God. are collaborating on a project together right now, actually. Uh, it's a it's a South Beach musical film that we're working on, and uh, so I got to meet Alan Menken uh, the first time there. I saw him in an elevator a couple years later. I didn't even tell him that when I saw him, but um, yeah. <laughs> I, so look, I got some great people. I, I actually interviewed George Foreman, also people know him from The Grill or you know him as the boxer. His his story is amazing. But look, you know, I, I find that we can learn from everyone, and uh, and I find the more people that I bring into my life and that I listen to, the more. I uh, have the potential uh, to grow uh, yes. as a human being. You know, hundred percent. That's a, that's exactly one of the main reasons why I did the podcast. Why I started this yeah. podcast. It was it was partially because um, I knew that I was going to learn a lot <coughs> from having these conversations right. in way in ways that I couldn't do before, um, where we're actually having these one on one conversations with people that I admire. Um, and and one of the other interesting things too, which I think you might find too with podcasts, is Humility does come into play a lot of times, too, because you find that a lot of these people that I speak with, uh, maybe that's the case for you as well, uh, have gone through so much pain, so much struggle themselves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, and what I feel is, is that it actually brings our community of artists closer um, by, right. by having these kinds of conversations from people that we look up to at such a high regard, with such high regard, right. to see that right. they have struggled so much, too, the pain that they've gone through. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's just an amazing thing to go yeah. a little bit deeper <clears throat> into your life of awesome. And again, like I said, you know, one of the things that I really was inspired by with you, um, with sort of discovering who you were as a, as a person, um, outside of your career as a creative is like I said, your desire to want to be a better person and is part of going out and speaking to people in small and large groups, is that part of uh, what I would maybe say is uh, you know, your <clears throat> desire to grow? And, and if you could speak to that a little bit. Oh, yeah, you, you nailed it. You said it perfectly. You know, one of the, the best ways to become great at something is to teach it. It's to teach it. And one Interesting, of the isn't that it? I yeah, it is. And one of the things that I, I talk about a lot is things like resilience and discipline and all those things. And the more that I talk about them, the more I'm reminded myself of all the work that I need to put in. You know, um, I'll give you one example. Um, when I was when I was at Columbus, Ohio, that's where I went to art school, Columbus College of Art and Design. And when I was there, I had tried to get into Disney the first time, got rejected. I didn't give up at that point. I was like pumped and ready to keep going. And I had this best friend named Andy. And Andy was by far the best artist in the school because this guy never stopped drawing. And everybody listening should check out his work. His name is Andy Harkness, H-A-R-K-N-E-S-S. -S -S. One of the greatest artists I've ever met and one of the greatest mm. people I've ever met. Nice. An inspirational figure. Yeah. I'm actually going to have him on the podcast soon. How do you spell his last name just so people can seek him out? Yeah. It's H-A-R-K-N-E-S-S. -S. He's also a children's book illustrator. He works at uh, Skydance today. He's been at Sony and Disney, art director. Mm. Nice. Art director on Moana. I mean, he's incredible. And Andy and I, one day, we went to the zoo to draw animals uh, for our portfolio. 
And there was about, I don't know, 15 or so students. We took a bus to the zoo. It was a freezing cold, bitter cold day. And we get to the zoo. And the second we get to the zoo, we all just run to the cafe, the Wendy's, just to warm up because it was freezing, <laughs> Mike, like bitter cold. <laughs> And, you know, I get a hot drink, and guys are talking to the girls, and girls are talking to the guys. And after about five minutes, Andy and I sharpen our pencils. We go out there, yeah. and we start looking for what animal intrigues us to draw. And it's freezing. I mean, it's freezing. So the last thing I want to do is be out there freezing. And we find in the elephants, there's this one elephant walking back and forth, like just repeating the same motion back They're trying and to find a coat. Right? <laughs> And it was so cool because someone like me and Andy who were studying animation and movement, to see an animal repeating the same motion back and forth was like gold. Yeah. So we just did drawing after drawing of this whole walk cycle. It was amazing. Afterwards, we get on the bus after about 45 minutes and I'm like showing Andy what I drew and he's showing me what he drew. And I said to one of the other guys, I said, hey, dude, we, we never saw you guys at the elephants. What animals were the rest of you were drawing? Where were you? The guy looks to me and he says, none of us ever left the Wendy's. I said, w what do you mean you didn't leave the Wendy's? He goes, well, we couldn't leave. I said, why? He goes, because it was too cold. Mm. I'm like, oh, it was too cold. Oh, so your dream is to work at Disney unless it's too painful. And I'm telling you, Mike, at that moment, that's when I knew someday I would get into Disney because I was going to outwork the competition because yeah. it's like you said. If you want to be great at something, it's going to be an insane amount of hard work. And that means really pushing through pain and struggle. Yeah. You know, one of the greatest motivational speakers in our day today is Tony Robbins. Everybody knows him. The guy's amazing. <clears throat> Tony Robbins tells the story how every morning he wakes up, the first thing he does is he dunks his body in an ice cold plunge. Like he has this little pool that he's built next to his many houses. Every house he goes to has one. If he's traveling in a hotel, he finds a local one where he fills a tub with ice and he plunges his body in frigid water for like 30 seconds, whatever mm. it is. And when you hear that story that he does that, you go, wow, Tony Robbins, man. He's like a Marine. He's a man. He could jump and he could <laughs> take it, man. He's awesome. But you know what's so fascinating that he said? He said recently in an interview, when he wakes up every single morning, the last thing that he feels like doing is plunging his body into ice cold water. But guess what? He does it anyway. Yeah. Part of the discipline that we need to be great at anything is not to let our emotions dictate our actions. Don't ask yourself, is this something I feel like doing? You do it because it's the right thing. And if you can make things like that habitual, become habitual, like I have a habit of drawing an hour a day. I have a habit of working on whatever flaw that I have because I want to become great. Whatever it is, whatever that, that, that thing is, don't let the emotions or the feelings dictate what we're going to do. Do it because it's the right thing. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've, um, uh, I don't know if it's a mental trick that I've done, but <clears throat> what I have, what I've, um, sort of, worked through throughout my years of wanting to become a better artist or even becoming a better business per person, et cetera, is that I try to focus on um, rather than looking at it as a negative, whatever it is I'm trying to work on, I yeah. think of it as a positive. I think about like, okay, what are what's my overall objective that I'm trying to get to? Right. And when I think about it that way, it sort of like changes my perspective. It's like... Um, what Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yeah, and so beautiful. for me, it's like the perspective of, you know, rather than looking at a struggle that I have to draw another 20 minutes or I have to finish this project, I think about it from this from the sake of like, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I love because I, I love doing something amazing. And even right. just like something like that changes the way I feel about what exercise or what project I'm working on. And it makes me enjoy it. It sort of like reminds me of why I'm doing this in the first place. You know, it's like absolutely people who are artists are like to even have the talent to be able to be artists is like yeah. an amazing thing. It's so incredible. It is. And it's if we right. can remind ourselves, like put ourselves back to that moment when we were children 
and we're just drawing for the sheer joy of it and yeah. fast forward that back to our lives right now, I feel like nothing is insurmountable that we have to accomplish if we just get that mindset of like, it's like, uh, you know, I've heard somebody say like, when a child falls down, when they're trying to walk, they, yeah. they don't cry, they get right back up. They fall, they get back up, they fall, they get back up. Right. It's, it's not a big deal. And, that's, it's, and it's just a part process. of the process. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. <clears throat> you know, when I, was, uh, when I was in high school, my parents hired an art teacher to come to my home. And she would give me these assignments. And she saw that when I was drawing the figures that she told me to draw, I never put the hands on. I would do like a circle for the hand or maybe make a mitten. Yeah. And then one day she's like, did you notice that there's a, an anatomical problem with all your drawings? I'm like, what is she? she goes, well, there's no hands. How is this woman going to pick up anything? How's he going to pick up anything? Yeah. She goes, why don't you draw hands? I go, well, because I'm, I'm not so good at the hands. She goes, oh, okay, guess what your homework's going to be? I'm like, what? She says, you're going to draw a hand from a different position every single night before you go to bed for six months. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And in six months, I became really able to draw hands. And she taught me one of those great lessons of life is sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone in order to turn our weakness into our strength. Mm. And if we have that attitude that that's part of the process and don't have the expectations that we're going to be great at everything and shy away from the flaws, if we face those flaws head on, with the goal of turning them into our strengths. Why? It's going to be uncomfortable, but you yeah. do it and you grow. You know, one of my favorite heroes growing up is number 23, Michael Jordan. And there's a true story told of him. Michael Jordan, first year in the NBA, he's like a scoring machine. He's Air Jordan, got the sneakers out already. And a sports writer comes up to him after a game and says, Michael, you're a scoring machine, but you have no defensive game. And Michael's like, oh, yeah? You know, Michael could have said to the guy, I just made a million dollars playing basketball. I'm going to listen to you. But Michael said in his mind, he heard one thing. Something I'm doing is giving that guy the perception that I don't have a defensive game. I guess I better work harder on defense. And he did. And next year in the NBA, one player was named Defensive Player of the Year. Number 23, Michael Jordan. Because if we find out what our weaknesses are, that's really the answer key to growing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. You know, um, that, that was a, a, an amazing little story. I admit that I was a little disappointed that you didn't say Don Mattingly for number 23. <laughs> I remember him. Yeah. <laughs> but I yeah, grew that, up in but, New York. You yeah, just yeah, dated yeah. yourself <laughs> like me. <I> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's exactly <clears throat> to the point. Um, that's fantastic. You know, I know we're, we're, I want to be very respectful of your time, but I, I, I do want to ask you a little bit, um, as we bounce back a little bit back and forth, uh, trying to manage our time here. Um, you know, you were, you were at such a pivotal, pivotal moment in, um, Disney animation history, uh, truly working there during the nineties when things were really Amazing, uh, but also yeah. very volatile at the same time. I'm sure you probably saw some of the worst parts of of the history <laughs> of Disney um, as a company. Yeah. Obviously, you know it was amazing from uh, probably Little Mermaid all the way till Pocahontas, and then things started to crumble. We had the breaking up with Jeffrey Katzenberg leaving, starting DreamWorks, which you're working for now. Yep. You know, what can you just give a little insight as, you know, for somebody who could be maybe perceived as a uh, creative cog in the wheel there? What was your perspective uh, while all of that was happening? I mean, you probably came in right <laughs> at the tail end of the good yeah. part before it started to change, right? I mean, what was that yeah. like? You're, it's funny because you're, you're saying, what the hell went on back then? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a couple quick things about that. Um, I've never spoke about this openly, so this is actually really fun. So, and I can say anything because I don't work for Disney now, so they can't really hire me. Uh, can't really fire me. Maybe they will hire me. All right, so he, I'll tell you a couple things. So first of all, um, yeah, I started right after Lion King. And everyone, you got to remember, right, the Disney Animation Studios was literally on the verge of closing down right after Black Cauldron 
before Michael Eisner and Roy Disney took over and all that, and Jeffrey Katzenberg, Disney Animation lost their way. They were living in this zone of what would Walt do? What would Walt do? They didn't have a real visionary leader. And Michael Eisner gets hired by Roy Disney. Basically, Roy Disney, who is Walt's nephew, goes to the board and tells them about this executive. I think he was at NBC or or CBS or something. Uh, And he comes over. He becomes the CEO of the company. And the first person he hires is Jeffrey Katzenberg to run animation and, and Walt Disney Pictures and whatever. And and they go to Ron and John, uh, and they, these are two directors, and they made Gra- Great Mouse Detective right before that, yeah. I think. Yeah. And uh, and they say, what do you work on? They have this Little Mermaid project, and they just put all their resources into the Little Mermaid. They bring in Alan Menken, and they decide to make it like a Broadway musical, which is really wasn't really done for a long time at mm-hmm. Disney anyway, mm-hmm. to have a real musical. And long story short, and by the way, you can hear all the details of this in my episode of my podcast where I interviewed Jody Benson, the voice of The Little Mermaid. Oh, nice. She's incredible. And we go into a lot of the detail. But basically, Little Mermaid saves Disney animation. And it makes a lot of money. And the soundtrack is incredible. And even teenagers are going to the movies. Parents are loving the movie. And then the next movie comes out. Rescue is down under, right? Most people didn't really watch it. I thought it, it was it a wasn't... fantastic movie, by the way. Just oh, side note, yeah. the animation's incredible. Oh, yeah. And by the way, anyone who hasn't seen it, if you're an artist, just watch the first five minutes of that movie. Oh, my God. Because yeah. it's all Glenn Keane. And animated. Glenn Keane, yeah. I mean, he's, uh, there go my goosebumps. Just, <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget watching that sequence the yeah. first time. And with the Bruce Broughton score and the Glenn Keane animation, the flying of that Golden mm-hmm. Eagle Mariner mm-hmm. Day with Code, it's just amazing. Amazing. So so that movie comes out. It doesn't do so well, but Beauty and the Beast comes out next, and boom. Animations change forever, and it, Beauty and the Beast becomes the first animated movie ever to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. Yeah. That's a big deal. Huge. That's a big deal. There was no animation category. That was Best Picture. It lost to Silence of the Lambs, I think, that year. Mm-hmm. But the movie does so big. Dates, nights, teenagers are going, adults are going, people without kids are going. And the music is everywhere. Be our guest. Be our guest. Amazing. People can't, they think it can't make any more money. Then Aladdin. Boom. <laughs> Aladdin soars. The, the money is huge. It's, a, it's so much more than Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid combined. Yeah. And now Disney reinvents animation. Other studios start to notice. You got three big hits right after another. And just when you thought, <laughs> it couldn't get any bigger. <laughs> Lion King comes out. And Lion King makes gajillion dollars more right. than even Aladdin. And you could read all the press. I remember it said, like, the roar heard around the world. And all these studios are now getting into animation. They can't believe it. And Disney's amazing. So what happens at the studio? Well, I get to the studio right after Lion King. And animators are now getting agents, managers, their contracts are getting negotiated bigger and bigger. They're becoming millionaires. I mean, it was incredible. And I remember going uh, to uh, a giant studio-wide event at a conference center in Disney World. And we had this satellite hookup on a big screen to our studio in Florida, the L.A. studio in Burbank, and the studio in Paris. All three studios. And Michael Eisner gets up there and all the big executives... And what's been happening in the culture at that point is animators are making a lot of money, but not everybody is. And Disney, who's making all the money, they're not giving a lot of the animators a lot of money. Yeah, They're giving them bathrobes with the logos on them and like new hats <laughs> and T-shirts. And I will never forget this one moment after we had the satellite hookup with all these studios. At the end, Michael Eisner says, anyone have any questions or anything? And this one layout artist, I'm not going to mention his name stands up goes up to the mic in front of thousands and thousands of people and he says i have one comment please don't give us any more bathrobes with logos on it or hats please pay us more money you're obviously making money let's let the artists start to reap the benefits of our labor amazing and and everyone was like oh my god we thought this guy lost his job but i'll never forget that so that's culturally what was happening disney got bigger and bigger Pocahontas, Hunchback, Mulan, Tarzan, all those movies. And then what happened was Pixar, you know, Pixar comes out, which was, which was, you know, Disney was, Pixar movies were made for Disney. So Toy Story was made for Disney by John Lasseter and Pixar. 
And Pixar starts making these different movies. And what's happening is Disney animation starts to fail then. They came out with yeah. movies like Treasure Planet and Atlantis. They started to fail while Pixar movies. What it, to, by, by, Toy by Story, the way, Bugs s- Life. S- yeah. s- side note. Isn't that fascinating? I'm still fascinated by the fact that that both were happening at the same time, which helped create this demise of hand-drawn animation. The quality started to go down because it could have been that they stood. They could have potentially still crushed it with great oh, yeah. stories, but for whatever reason, right? Pixar was killing it with the stories. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what I think the reason is. Yeah, and I was in the studio at the time and I saw the culture. What happened was the animators started making movies for themselves and not for the audiences anymore. Right. Meaning they wanted to be respected. I want to make a movie that's darker. People used to say that all the time. You know, Atlantis. I want to make sci-fi. We, they, wanted, they wanted a space movie so badly. Yeah. And if you look, Treasure Planet took place in space. Atlantis, yeah. space. Yeah. Like they really yeah. wanted sci-fi, a sci-fi. Yeah. They really wanted a Star Wars. I mean, that's really yeah. what they wanted. They, and they didn't really make the movies for the audience. I thought they made it really for more for themselves. And I remember, by the way, the first time I ever saw Toy Story, it was about six months before the movie came out. John Lasseter comes to Disney World in a big screening room just for the animators in Florida, our studio. We were working on Mulan, I think, at the time, or maybe Tarzan. And uh, we all go into this big movie theater, and we're all cynical artists and animators. And we're like, what's this computer animated? Like, this, right? The movie starts. There's no musical opening. Remember, we were in Alan Menken years, right? There's no musical opening. No character sings a song. It changed the rules. And we were, we were like, who do they think they are? And then there's one scene in that movie. The scene where the soldier goes down in the beginning. Mom opens the door, steps on the soldier, right? She walks away. The soldier comes back to life, a little toy, the little green guy. And the other soldier comes up and says, come on. He's like, no, no, you got to go on without me. And like, we all burst into <laughs> tears laughing. And from that moment on, the animation world was forever changed for us. You couldn't just do an Alan Menken musical formula anymore. There was something new. By the way, the next time I felt that was over the movie The Incredibles. You know, the first time anyone saw The Incredibles, your mouth dropped. And you're like, Mm. holy cow. So good. That's a live action, fantastic. It's like watching True Lies or like The Rock or something. Or or just but even more fantastical. Mm -hmm. Brad Bird did an amazing job. But... You know, Pixar started making these successful movies, Disney animation movies, the hand-drawn were going down. And then Pixar started going, wait, why am I taking notes from Disney when I'm right. the one that's making the big movies? They had a big power struggle. Yeah. And of course, Roy Disney and Michael Eisner had a big power struggle. I was actually uh, staying at the Trump International Hotel in New York, and Roy Disney was staying there also. And he and I talked on the front steps. I'll never forget that oh, night. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I and I, we talked for a minute, and I put a note under his door later with the front desk saying how much I appreciated the the fight he was doing for the animators, and he mm-hmm. wrote me back a yep. note. I still have it wow. before he died, just thanking me for my support. But it was a it was a struggle, and then ultimately, of course, uh, Disney buys Pixar. Eisner's out. Bob Iger runs the company, and they. Who I think Pixar. did an amazing job. I mean, he was the yeah. closest to Walt. I think that they he had. really did. He really did. But so, yeah, it was a struggle to go through it all. But, you know, I want to share, if I could share just one final story, if you have time. Yeah. I want to share one, one, one quick story for you. And I think this is really, um, if, I, if I could distill all the things that we've spoken to about, it, for me, which I think is one of the most important messages that everyone, I think, needs to, to hear, whether you're an artist or, or whatever you do in life. When I was in art school, um, I found out who a man named Glenn Keane was, right? You you mentioned him earlier, Mike. And Glenn Keane, for those of you that don't know, is one of the most, if not the most, talented Disney animator that ever lived, especially in movies. I mean, he designed The Little Mermaid. He designed The Beast. He designed Tarzan, Aladdin, Pocahontas. You've heard of his characters. And when I was in art school, I thought, you know what? If Glenn Keane can draw like that, I should find out what kind of pencil he uses. And I found out that he used some special tomboy, whatever, I don't remember what it was called, pencil. (laughs) And I thought that if I could get the pencil like Glenn Keane, then I could draw like Glenn Keane. 